Dean, thanks for being on the show. Hi, Jay. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So I'm excited to chat because, uh, gosh, you just have uh, such a rich history of experience at all kind of levels that I, I've never been at. Uh, you've had uh, some massive corporate experience. Now you're uh, more heavily in leadership and entrepreneurship. Uh, you were the former uh, executive vice president, chief, of, chief, uh, chief financial officer, if I can talk today, for the Walt <laughs> Disney Studios. That's exciting. I probably could have a whole episode just talking about that. Um, I have five little ones, so we love Disney, uh, all things Disney, essentially. And, um, but today we're going to talk a lot about leadership and um, you know, what that means for people and, and really how they can improve themselves and everything else. So talk to me a little bit about, I always am interested when people make a transition from uh, an established, uh, what I would call corporate career, you know, um, into uh, more what I would consider an entrepreneurial venture where you are running your own company. So why did you make that transition, number one, versus just either staying on the corporate ladder and just retiring? Um, or um, like, why did you make that transition? What, what, what spurred that thought? I, I think I need to give you a little bit of history because it, the foundation for it was formed a long time ago. Uh, I won't go all the way back to my early childhood, but suffice to say that when I was in my early 20s, I felt that I was going through life, going through the motions, and there was something missing for me. And I was introduced to, back then, what was called a self-awareness training. To, in today's world, much more acceptable. It's considered emotional intelligence training. And on a personal level, I was able to get in touch with so many things about myself that I didn't know. I thought I had convinced myself that I was really my intellect. I was really good in school, got good grades, got a job. And my path is not normal for doing what I'm doing now. My first job was as a, uh, in a big eight firm, back then it was big eight, now big four public accounting firm. And I took what I learned in the emotional intelligence trainings and applied it to the way I interacted with people at work initially individually and then ultimately in the way that I led teams. And I made a few jumps, which were really based on, I couldn't put it into words back then, but now I would say, I tell people all the time, find a culture you can thrive in. And so I kept looking for what was that right culture and learned a lot of things along the way. And eventually when I got to Disney, I worked my way up through the ranks and the culture there was, the closer I got to the top, the more under Michael Eisner, it was a command and control style. And people were, were being disingenuous with me on a daily basis, just to get the information they wanted, to try and get the power they wanted. And it got to a point where I had a hard time turning that off when I went home at the end of the day. So I, I ended up leaving there and going to Fox. Fox, even though it's a big empire, was very entrepreneurial in nature. And so when I went there, in there, instead of being straight armed and told not to get in the way of the operation. My chairman came in the first day and he said, you're the CFO, you can go to any meeting you want, you can get involved in any project you want, you don't need to ask permission. And that was a completely different feel for me. And so one of the areas I jumped into was, that one of the things I noticed right away was there wasn't a lot of leadership development happening there. So I got together with HR right away and we started doing first just some workshops with senior leadership and got people to understand more about mutual trust and respect, more about collaboration. And after we did it with the senior leadership team, we wanted to develop the bench. I wanted to develop the finance bench. So I started just meeting with some middle directors and ultimately that program grew to a studio-wide um, program with as many as 25 people in the program for nine months going through and we can talk details, but going through everything about leadership. And to be honest with you, at the end of my time at Fox, that was what I was most jazzed about. That's what I was most excited about. And so why I transitioned was, number one, Disney bought the studio. And I had spent my time at Disney, and I didn't want to go back into what is still largely a command and control environment, uh, even though it's better under Bob Iger, for sure. And I'm not taking. A, I'm not talking about what they do with their brand because they're the best at it. But just in terms of the environment, so I really wanted to be able to help develop people and help people and companies evolve and learn the lessons that I learned, but learn them so much faster because I can help guide them. And it was time for me. I, I said, "What do I want to do with the rest of my career, the rest of my life, career life?" 
and it was have that kind of impact. And I know it's starting from scratch. And I was like, I was telling you just before we started, I'm learning all about entrepreneurialism at the real level now, because <laughs> it is my own company for the first time. Yeah. You know, um, it's so, it's always interesting to me because I just never was in any, I've never been in a corporate environment of any kind. Um, I started this business that I run now when I was 17. Uh, we've been in business for almost 22 years. We've grown every single year. Um, but, you know, it's just all I've ever known. And so when I hear those stories of people making those transitions, either direction, like somebody ran an entrepreneur sure. adventure and then moved into kind of the corporate space or vice versa, um, it's always fascinating. But what's interesting to me is a couple things about what you said. One is, I feel like a lot of my own personal transition right now is in a similar path only because like, I love this idea of like, how do you develop people? How do you develop teams? How do you develop leadership? How do you put people through, uh, you know, different assessments they might learn about themselves? I think self-awareness is a superpower. Um, and, and my agency runs pretty well without me now. And so I now get to do a lot more fun things like this podcast to just help share knowledge and ideas, workshops, all those kinds of things. Um, unrelated side note, uh, the Disney stuff is interesting because I had just recently read Bob Iger's new book, um, The Greatest Ride of My Life. And it's interesting to hear his perspective on the whole Eisner situation, all the things that un unfolded at Disney. It gives you- Yeah, at least we could do a whole show on that. Yeah, we won't do that today, <laughs> but maybe another time. But it, it is interesting because it gives you kind of an insight on what some of the stress looks like from his perspective in those types of roles at that level. And it made me think I would never want to be the CEO of a large corporation. It sounds horrible. Um, uh, it's kind of like a, I, when I was a kid, I always wanted to be president of the United States. And now I'm like, that seems like the worst job ever. No, that is the worst job. <laughs> Couldn't agree so more. let's talk about one of the things you mentioned when you, when you got to Fox was uh, what I kind of heard from it was this idea of like autonomy and trust that you were kind of given that from, from other leaders, you know, around you, you said, Hey, we've hired you for this role. We trust you. We're going to give you autonomy to start making some decisions. So how do you view trust in relationship to leadership development? And, and, and did that have an impact on you at Fox? Oh, it had a huge impact because I felt I could go into the chairman and say anything that I needed to, I could initiate a project most of the time and not feel like I was being second guessed. You know, I, I always had to be careful, particularly at a studio, and I think it's part of what gave me a, a good reputation of not impeding the creative process. Mm. I'm finance. I can talk numbers all I want, but we can't. At, at our core, we were a creative enterprise, and we couldn't we couldn't kill that creativity. Um, but it, but the trust level was huge, and I think honestly, that is when we first did those workshops with the senior leadership team. That's what was missing, and it wasn't that anybody. Basically, the unspoken rule at Fox was do whatever you need to do to make your business successful. Sometimes that meant for presidents of divisions to step on somebody else's toes. And instead of working collaboratively to see what's best for the whole company, there was too much of that going on and, uh, and too much in the way of silos and lack of communication. So by bringing the people into these workshops, we did some exercises on a very personal level and people said things to each other. Uh, constructively that they had never said before. And people learn to understand each other's uh, personalities better, their agendas better, what they were trying to accomplish. And then we all started working more effectively together. And I'm, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you it was Nirvana. Some of those habits, those people had been there for 25 years, they're hard to break, but they started having conversations in the hallway they had never had before. So as you started to develop those workshops, like what, what tools and resources did you lean on? Because obviously, hey, we're going to have a leadership workshop, but like, how did you decide what, what tools to use and really what resources did you use um, to, to help you facilitate those things? Well, um, I stayed in touch with a number of people from the personal development programs I did when I was in my 20s. One of them is Jack Swizzig, who is my own personal mentor. And I knew he was doing workshops. So I mentioned to HR, I said, I know somebody who does this. And they said, great, why are you holding back on us? Let's talk to him. So I introduced him and he came in and he did three one and a half day workshops for our senior leadership team to get started. So he already had what he needed in place. It was just a matter of HR making the commitment to it. And, and it was a bit of a stretch because I came in in October of 2001, right after 9-11. And the training and development budget had basically been cut to zero. We were in austerity mode. So it, it, it took a little bit of work to get them to realize that this is going to be a huge benefit for us going forward. We should commit to this to get started. 
And it was really, that was the, the real kickoff for me to start doing more work after that. Because once we did the senior leadership team, I said, well, that's great, but we have 2,500 more people around the world in the studio. What are we doing about them? And so it just became a, a domino effect where we started coming up with more ways to, to get down into the other levels of the, of the group. Yeah, I think um, a lot of this stuff has become, I think, a lot more popular maybe over the last decade than it was prior to that. But um, I know for me personally, it's had such a huge impact understanding personality types and asking tough questions and, and really taking the time to work on the team. Some of the biggest mistakes I've ever made in small business, um, and I've told them this, is when I developed our leadership team here, I just picked guys who were kind of in charge of certain areas of the company and said, all right, we need a leadership team and y'all are on it now and let's get things done. And, and what, I, what I told them before was one of the big mistakes I made was I didn't prepare them for leadership. I had naturally had to like learn it over time and developed through just trial and error over 20 years, but I, but I didn't give them that opportunity. <laughs> And, and they didn't, I didn't kind of give them the reality of the cost of leadership. I think everybody thinks they want to be a leader, but I think what they really want is power. And, and that's just not always true. So when you're working with an organization and, and you're going, hey, let, let's put together a leadership workshop or do some executive coaching, what are some of the questions that you ask them uh, to help them kind of figure out what needs to be the next step? Well, first of all, those one and a half day workshops we did, those things were just cracking the ice. And there's a couple of things that you mentioned I want to respond to because one of the challenges is when you are coming in to develop leadership in people that are already and have been for a while leading teams, there is an element in their conscious and subconscious that what they have done so far has worked. So they have these belief systems and behaviors that are based on, based on those belief systems that are hard for them to give up. Those are what give us our comfort zone. So we have to break through those barriers and get into more of what we call the authentic self that doesn't have these fixed beliefs and behaviors protecting us in the way that we operate. Um, also, people that are high up in the company feel that they're supposed to know all the answers themselves. So they don't want to appear weak or anything. So they'll make decisions and won't necessarily listen to feedback. So I work with those people. I coach those people. They are more of a challenge typically because they're, at least it takes a while to break down that, that old system. So what I started doing is the leadership, the accelerated leadership program that I developed that I do now, we take, it started with just a few people in finance, uh, having breakfast once a week on Tuesdays and just talking about life. And it grew into the program I was talking about with 25 people, where we go through it for nine months. And I focused on managers, directors, early vice presidents, those people that didn't yet have those foreign beliefs about the right way to lead teams. And they are like sponges. They want to know the techniques. They want to learn. And maybe at some level, they want power. But they also, through the program, realize we create this huge level of trust amongst 25 people that are from different areas of the company. And then they go back over the, I mean, they're in their, their job still while we're doing the nine month program, but they go back to their jobs and integrate what they've learned into their interaction with their teams, into interaction with others. And in the middle layer of the company, you start developing this, this high performance attitude about sharing everything, trusting people, working together, collaborating for what's best for the company. And then they start assuming positions of more and more responsibility. So the tools are exercises that we do. We do feedback exercises. We, do, we use what we call the discovery model, which the difference is I could sit here on a chart or in a PowerPoint and tell you how to ride a bike. But until you get on the bike and ride the bike, you're not really going to know how it feels. And we do exercises so people understand how it feels to give and receive feedback, how it feels to confront issues that are getting in the way of the team in a constructive way. So they get more comfortable with it and their comfort zone expands. And then, like I said, the more of those people we trained and developed, the more those people could influence the overall culture of the company. One of the things that you mentioned there was this idea of the authentic self. Uh, talk a little bit more about that and what you mean by that and how it can have value. Yeah, you know, the, 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 the primary way I, I describe it is um, I ask people, what are, what are some attributes about a child that you know? And we'll, we'll talk about, you know, they're authentic, they're honest, they're vulnerable, 
they're they're brave and courageous you know they'll you know toddlers will stand up on things they don't they don't worry about falling and hurt themselves all these things that are just like full of life about us and they're trusting and caring and then something happens so let's say mom sends johnny out into the front yard and says why don't you go out and play johnny goes out and play comes across a bunch of kids one of the kids one of the let's say a girl turns to him and says get lost you creep so johnny starts forming beliefs the front yard's dangerous girls are dangerous. Uh, my mom doesn't love me. Why would she set me in the front yard? Um, you know, and all these feelings about I'm not mm. good enough can start to be formed. So then Johnny's at a high school dance and he's walking across the floor to ask somebody to dance. And that little voice is inside his head going, no, remember what happened? This isn't good. And before he even gets across the room, he turns around and goes back to the other side because he has this belief that says, no, it's not going to happen. And he gets to be right because he never took the risk of stepping outside his comfort zone. So what our exercises do in a very positive way is give us an opportunity to get back in touch with those parts of us that we deny. Mm. Beginning of our call, I said, I convinced myself I was only my intellect. I was lucky enough to go through that process and learn all these other, all these other, I don't, I would, I don't know if skills, attributes, whatever you want to call them about me that I had forgotten about, got out of touch with, and now I use them all the time. In my life, I'm a connector because in, in the most extreme way, because I'll take somebody who's so far on one end of the behavior chart and somebody on the other end, and I'll get them to collaborate and work together. Because I just naturally, I call it the mediator, call it getting everybody, wanting everybody to be kumbaya, call it whatever you want. I'm that way in my family. Whenever mom and one of the kids would have a problem, I'd get everybody back together so we could have a constructive conversation. That's a part of me I had. I wasn't even aware of until I got feedback about mm. it. I didn't know I did that well. So feedback is a valuable, I, I always say feedback is the least expensive, most valuable management tool that we have. And that is, um, are you familiar with the Johari window? No. The Johari window is a simple matrix. Across one axis, it says what other people see about me and what they don't see, and what I see about me on the other axis and what I don't see. What you and I both see about me is what we call my public self. It's what I put out there. It's what you experience. Sure. The things that you see about me that I don't are my blind spots. That's where mm -hmm. feedback comes in. The things that I see that you don't are my facade or my private self, the things that I protect. The more I'm willing to be open to feedback and the more I'm willing to share more about myself, then more of those move into my public self. You and I would become more aware about me and who I am. Sure. And then that, that mystery box that you don't see and I don't see, that fourth quadrant, magically, it's sort of like Maslow's hierarchy. I mean, he, he was constantly looked to be self-actualized. That stuff starts moving into the other two boxes. Hmm. It's the more I share and the more I'm willing to be open to feedback, the more I learn about myself, even other, I have other ha-ha moments because I'm more open to experiencing new things about myself. And those are all about you talked about self-awareness, being our authentic self. It's, it's all connected. So I think that um, I always say that the word blind spots is always interesting to me because I think some people associate it with weaknesses. And I had a pastor one time say this in a message. I thought it was interesting. He said, um, the difference between a weakness and a blind spot is weaknesses. We know, we know what our weaknesses are. We don't know what our blind spots are. That's why they're called blind spots. Right. And uh, I was kind of like, wow, that's really a good perspective. And to your point, like the blind spot is the thing that other people can see. But it is really interesting to think about the things that we don't see and others don't see. And how do those things come to light over time um, is fascinating to me. One thing I'd love to talk about is um, you have obviously made a, a transition from, like I said, the corporate environment to really a, a more entrepreneurial environment. You're running your own leadership coaching business, if you will. Um, and so I'm curious what uh, kind of roadblocks or hurdles you've come across along the way that you're like, wow, I didn't expect this, or this is different than something I've had to deal with before. You know, my guess is that in a lot of those other environments, you had very large teams of people that you could lean on with all kinds of resources and skill sets and abilities. And when you scale back and start something new, you don't have the same volume of people. And so what, what kind of roadblocks have you run into along the way as you've switched to entrepreneurship? Well, first of all, was just not knowing anything about it, <laughs> trying to figure it out. Um, I, I went to a, I signed up for something that a number of people mentioned me called Strategic Coach, which is a uh, company that 
brings together entrepreneurs. And even though people are in very different businesses, there were things that I could learn from them about how to start up a business. One of the things I'm doing is I'm writing a book because I think it helps explain what I do and why I do it. And yep. I probably wouldn't have taken that on had I not gone to strategic coach and understood the value of that. Uh, and, and not just the value, but then they'd, they'd say things to me like, writing a book's easy. It's selling the book that's hard. Yeah, that's and so true. They, they, they help connect me in ways that help me get the book out of my head and, and all that. Something I, again, I never thought I would write a book. So um, I'm learning from others how to do some of these things administratively. Um, it's a challenge, particularly now with, with COVID. I was having, I, I'm using part-time assistance because right now I don't really have a lot of employees. I know a lot of people in the space that are partners with me in the program. So when I do a program in a company, I bring them in to do at various facets of it. Sure. Um, I think when you ask me, what are the difficulties to me? It's, it's funny. It's, it's that command and control and mm -hmm. company politics that I just, before in my own companies that I was in and now in companies that I go and work with, it's amazing to me how people won't do things for the greater good, how they're, mm -hmm. they'll protect their silos, how they'll continue to do that be internal um, obstructive behavior. And I just always ask myself, even at Fox, I asked myself, because again, that mantra was, do whatever you do need to do for your business to be successful. Mm -hmm. And there was so much energy expended internally fighting amongst ourselves, just trying to be able to get our division, our, our studio versus another area, like the TV division to be able to do something with a piece of intellectual property. And there wasn't this cooperative collaborative attitude. And we spent so much energy. If we had worked together and expended mm -hmm. that kind of energy to dominate the marketplace collectively, I think we could have been much more successful, but to me, it just seems like a no brainer yet. So many people won't go there. Uh, I remember when I left Disney, there was uh, one individual and I, I didn't use these words, but it really was along the lines of why can't we all just get along? Right. And, and her response to me was, no, we just don't do it that way here. Hmm. And I, and that's one of, that was one of the defining moments for me, knowing that that wasn't going to be the culture for me long-term. Yeah. Um, it's interesting you mentioned strategic coach because I'm literally right now about halfway through uh, Dan Sullivan, who started strategic coach his yep. new book, who not how uh, really interesting book for anybody that's listening that wants to know like how, how he does things ultimately, which is how do I find the right who not how to he asked the question, not how do I do it, but who do I need to help get it done. Exactly. And yep. um, really, I'm only halfway through the book, but it's super interesting read uh, so far. So it's interesting you brought that up because I'm really reading that right now. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's interesting to kind of think about what that looks like from a transition standpoint, um, as you move from that corporate environment into the entrepreneur environment, because now you kind of get to create your own, you know, culture, you get to create your own plan, yeah. you get to do there, it your there's, way, you know, there's the good and the bad, right? I, is, yeah. I, I get to define everything I want to be and how I want my company to be. And I know nothing about how to do that going in. <laughs> so it, and literally, I'd be, I was six months in and just talking about how I felt like, I feel like I'm shooting in every direction huh. and I don't know what's working, what's not working. And people are like, yeah, you're right where you need to be. This is, this is normal. <laughs> and I have a much, now I'm a year and a half in really. And I have so much of a better feel for the things that matter, yeah. what has impact. Um, I think early in it, just to be honest, I think I was selling. Mm -hmm. as opposed to just connecting and talking about value and, and whether I had an engagement coming out of it or not. And, and I don't need to work, to your point. Why didn't I just move into right. retirement? I'm doing this because I'm excited about going in and making a difference and helping these companies out. Yet, I still need to convey that effectively. And they need to understand that. And I need to understand. It takes a little while to build that credibility. Most of my yeah. contacts are not coming from my previous work associates. They're coming in these roundabout ways. So these people coming in don't know anything about me. Yeah. And it takes time before they're going to let me come into their company and spend nine months shifting the culture of their company with these leaders. Um, have you read the book Building a Story Brand by Donald Miller? No. You, I think, would really 
get a lot of value out of that. Uh, it's one of my favorite marketing and communication books. And it's really built for, you know, kind of the entrepreneurial mindset. And I teach this stuff a lot because it's so valuable for us on the marketing side. But some of the things that you just talked about, it, it could have a really big impact for you with regards to how do you create that impact? Because what I'm hearing there is like, you know, it's not about money and power anymore. It's about what impact can I create? what kind of work that I can do that I feel like I'm, you know, fulfilling my purpose as a human being um, and, and adding value to other people. And yet you can only do that if other people will allow you into that space in order to do that. And Correct. That, the framework in that book, essentially without, you know, turning into a 30 minute episode about this, it, it walks through seven steps of communication and it's really all about story. So it asks the question, what does the customer want? They're the character in the story, not you. Um, what do they want? What problem do they have? What's their external problem, which is clear and obvious, their internal problem, how they're feeling about it, and their philosophical problem, what do they believe about it? And then you're the guide. You come alongside them with empathy and authority to help them win, ultimately help them overcome their problem. You give them a clear plan. You call them to action. You show them what failure looks like because people need to know if they, if they do nothing or buy from somebody else or, or buy from you, what are the differences? And ultimately doing nothing is often what people do. So what's at risk? Right. And then lastly, what is success? So those are the seven parts of that framework. And um, just based on what you were talking about, I think you would really enjoy it. It's a quick read. It's, it's, it's a fun, fun book. And um, it'll really be valuable on the entrepreneurial marketing side for sure. Yeah, um, I'll definitely pick that up and give it a read because I'm like, that kind of guidance is the kind of guidance I'm, that's, that's all new to me. Yeah. That's when I was a magic. CFO, when I was a CFO, I didn't have to build a story brand. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't do a whole lot with my finances other than what I have to do. I've got a meeting with my virtual CFO uh, in a couple hours today, actually. <laughs> so I'll let him sort that out. Um, but the marketing stuff I just love and the communication and storytelling ultimately, which you right. came from a, you know, a storytelling environment, even though you were on the finance side and understanding how to take those stories and turn them into a thing that invites the customer in to that story so that they're the primary character. And that's the big pivot shift from a messaging standpoint is it's not all about you. It's all about them and what they are going to get at the end of the right. day. I always tell people that the big mistake most of us make in our marketing is we want to make ourselves the hero and we're not the hero. We're the guide. And yet in all stories, the guide is actually the strongest character. The strongest character right. in Star Wars is not Luke Skywalker, even though he's the hero. It's Obi-Wan, Kenobi, and Yoda. They're the strongest yep. characters in the story. So right. anyway. Yeah, um, thanks for that. Yeah, it's good stuff. I love it. Uh, so so I want to transition just a little bit. Um, and, and three things that I love to talk about. Um, the, the first is work-life balance. It means something different to everybody. And I think it changes through different seasons of life. I don't even really love the term that much, to be completely honest. But I love talking about it because it matters a lot to me. I've got uh, five kiddos who are now no longer small. They're eight to 16 almost. Um, and so work-life balance matters a lot to me, even though it's very rarely balanced. So I'm curious, what does that term even mean to you, number one? And how has that changed through different seasons of your life? Well, let me, let me just start. I'll work my way backwards. The story I told you about why I ended up leaving Disney was a big statement about how I feel about my family because how I had to be in that environment to survive um, what meant that I had to behave in ways that weren't truly authentic for me. I didn't feel comfortable being more aggressive and being, um, you know, having to protect my territory and things like that. But that was the nature of the beast there. And I have not found anybody really effective yet at being able to walk out of an environment like that and flip a switch and turn it off. And so when I went home at night and I was with my family, I could feel how it was affecting my behavior. And I didn't like it. I felt more disconnected from my family. And so let me, let me tell you a story. Um, I'll say two things, I think, to answer this question. One is uh, I met my wife when we did the live spring training uh, we didn't do the same training, but back in around 1980, 81. And so we have a common foundation about being authentic, being emotionally connected, all these different things. And we raised our children that way. And when people say, what's your secret? Because we have pretty, two pretty well-balanced kids. They say, what's your secret? And we always look at each other and go, A, luck, maybe. But B, we always made it a, a priority to be emotionally connected to them. Not just knowing what they were doing, but truly being connected with them. And... I remember coming home, uh, I, th I think it was a weekend actually, and my son, we had a neighbor across the street who, a kid who was, he was trouble. He was getting tackled in the front yard by the police all the time. He was the perfect 
example for us to show our kids of what not to do and how not to live their lives. And I think my son was 13 or 14 one day and we were having a conversation. He didn't like the way it was going and he stormed off and he went and slammed his door in his room. And I walked down the hall. I get emotional every time I tell this story. I don't know why, I, I do know why, but I, I walked down the hall, I burst into his room and I said, not in my house. I said, you're not gonna be like this guy across the street. Mm. And he said, you don't know what I'm going through. And I said, I do know what you're going through. He said, oh really? Tell me. I said, okay. I said, when you're outside and there's 15 or 20 of you friends hanging out and I see everybody standing around communicating with each other and you're on the perimeter and you're watching and you're not saying anything, it's not because what you think you have to say isn't important. It's because your mind is completely blank and you have no idea how to contribute to the conversation. Hmm. And he looked at me and he said, how do you know that? I said, because I was that kid. Hmm. That was me. I had a I had a bully as an older brother, and I learned that it was better to just self protect, be quiet. Sometimes it was better not to show up because it was safer. And so I knew how to disconnect, and I saw that he was disconnected. So he was a little uncomfortable in his own skin as well. I found out about a thing called Awakening the Warrior Within, a workshop where, on day two of that workshop, guys in soft body armor, six foot five, ex former bad guys come in, they want to get back to society. And we go through this thing with them. He had to physically learn how to take those guys down at 13 mm -hmm. years old. And he walked out of that workshop, carrying himself differently. He, he was, nobody ever messed with him again. Mm -hmm. He was more comfortable talking and, and communicating. So family's everything to me and I will invest whatever I need to. And I look at my company that way. I'll go in these companies and I'll go home and say, the group isn't shifting the way I want them to shift. What do I need to do? How can I be better at facilitating this? So um, it's changed over time. My kids are both grown up. I have two grandkids. My daughter's now expecting. It's still about maintaining that relationship and being willing. Sometimes it's hard because they get their families and they live their lives a certain way. And I don't, I don't want to interject and be an intrusion. Yeah. But at the same time, I want to keep that authentic communication going. So whether it's politics or something going on in the world that creates some tension, I want to talk through that tension and make sure that we can have that mutual trust and respect, have a conversation about it and walk away and still be as connected as we've ever been. So um, family's important. I went home, I coached soccer while I was a CFO at Disney, um, left work early one or two days a week to go do that. I just made it a priority and still made sure that nobody thought I was sloughing off that I was carrying my load. Mm. Yeah, I love that idea of just being intentional. You know, yeah. you know I'm just this is what I've decided to do, right. and be, because I, I think, I think the easy thing, it's especially this happens a lot for entrepreneurs is like, I mean, I started this work that I do now because I love the work that I do. Like, I don't hate Mondays. I like going to work. Like, I like yeah. to do the things that I get to do. I love showing up and doing podcasts. I love doing strategic marketing communication strategy sessions with clients. I I enjoy that stuff. And so it's easy for me to, when people are like, oh, I work too much. I'm like, I could work 16 hours a day and probably be pretty happy about it. Like I, it doesn't, I don't need like an outlet. Like my business is my hobby. Now some people would say that's not healthy, but whatever. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I also like have a standard vision for what my future looks like. And I want to be married to the same woman, you know, when I'm 70 years old. And I want five children who will still call me um, and ask me for advice. Like, yep. that's what I want. And so, yeah. and, and that's, that's the top priority. And so everything else filters through that. And there's times I've mixed that up, but I just think like that deciding what you want and then visualizing that future is just so powerful. And then making intentional choices like, Hey, I'm taking off a little early on these particular days to do these things. This morning I came into work late because I wanted to work out with my son at the gym. He's 16 years old. I'm not going to yeah. get those chances very often anymore. Yeah. You know, no, that's great. And you're right. Cause all this, like we get off course sometimes. That's why feedback's so important. My wife will yeah. pull me aside and say, you know, hey, why are you doing this? Or here's what you're doing, and let's talk about it and get me back on track. And I'm I may always, I may not always like hearing the feedback in the moment, yeah. but I will always digest it and see what's applicable and what I can learn from it. So that actually reminds me to, about a question I was gonna ask earlier and then I forgot to. So now I want to bring it up, even though it's a lot of order on feedback. When you're talking yeah. about getting feedback from a team, 
And that, that could be somebody who's a peer or somebody who reports to you or somebody you report to. What, what's some counsel you'd get, you would give when I go, hey, I want to get some good feedback. Should it be anonymous? Should it be in person? Should it be in writing? Like what, what strategies do you have to help get the right feedback? That's something I struggle with. Yeah, I, I think it depends on how close the group is. If, I, if, if Like, for example, when I do my nine-month program, I've got that group of people together and we go deeper and deeper into levels of feedback over time. Yeah, I think it can be the way I did it with my staff to introduce it is I would bring them into a room. I, I always knew when I needed to do feedback. It's when there was almost a line outside my office about people complaining about other people. Right. And so I said, look, why are you telling me you're all adults? I get them in a room right. and I would, I usually started out like this. Here's two questions. Get in a dyad, two people together, and then we'll rotate people and just answer the following two st statements. Uh, what I admire you about a manager is or as a leader is, whatever the term is that makes the most sense. So start with the positive. And then what I, what I see that would allow you to be a better manager or leader is. And usually in that interaction, the information will come through that allows, um, allows people to say what they've been unwilling to say so far. So mm -hmm. that's, an, that's an easy way to get it started. And then you wanna bring the whole group back together at the end of that session, making sure that Nobody got dumped on and is devastated sure. and things like that. As you build mutual trust and respect, there's so many different things you could do. We do one exercise in our program where it's called corporate lifeboat. They're essentially voting each other off the team. And it's not real, but it doesn't matter that it's real because nobody wants to get voted off the team. And sometimes people have been saying, will say things in that exercise they haven't shared for five months. And I had one individual who was so upset, not at the feedback she got, but that they hadn't told her for five months. She goes, honestly, mm. we've been here for this long and you have been unwilling to share this and I could work on it. Yeah. You're, are you hearing that beeping? Cause I thought I had all that off. No, you're good. I don't <laughs> hear anything. Okay, good. Um, so I think feedback is a, is a great exercise and you have to ease your way into it. But once you get a group to trust and realize the feedback is constructive in nature and it's really intended to help and not hurt, you can you can go so far in changing the culture of the group. Yeah, it's so good. Um, and I think that's a big deal. Of, it's, it's easy to think something about somebody else and not tell them. Um, and I think that the mindset is exactly what you said a minute ago, which is if somebody was thinking something about you that would be something you could improve, wouldn't, wouldn't you want to know about it? Exactly. And, um, and I think as long as you're in a position where the pe person knows first that you care about them, um, then you can give them feedback. I always, um, especially in like a more religious circles that I'm in, I always use the example of Jesus and I always say, look, in almost all scenarios, he built relationship first and then he asked for change. You know, yep. he met Zacchaeus uh, walking down the road. Zacchaeus was a tax collector that nobody really liked. Uh, tax collectors were hated in that time period. They were really they still villains. are, I think. Well, that's true, but, <laughs> but then they were really, really villains and thieves most of the time. And um, and the first thing he said to him was, "Hey, Zacchaeus, let's go have dinner. I'm going to your house." He actually invited himself over, but still, um, he said, "Hey, I'm going to your house today for dinner." And and so other people thought that was shocking, but he built relationship first, right. and then he said, "Hey, here's some things that need to improve." And I think that's a great example. Um, gosh, we're completely out of time, but I want to ask you two last things as, and, and we'll use this to kind of close on. The first is any kind of parting advice you'd give people about really building a business or in this case, developing leadership, uh, just a, a parting idea that you, you want to add value to people with today. And then the last thing is where people can find you online and learn more about what you do. Okay. The parting advice, I'll, I'll say two things very quickly. One is the missing piece in organizations is developing people in the middle at, at all levels of the company, not just senior leadership, because you do that, those people then start being contagious in that behavior around the company. So fill in the missing piece. The second one is um, if you develop trust and mutual respect inside your company, you will open up a flow of creative ideas people will feel more comfortable and safe bringing their ideas forward and knowing others aren't going to trash them. They're going to work with you to build them, or at least you guys can, can have conversations around them. But I, it's amazing to me how much the creativity within a company is stifled because people aren't willing to, to take that step. So that's the advice I would give to people. Look inside. You've got amazing creative resources on your teams already. Um, where people can find me, uh, 
HallettLeadership.com is my website. That's probably the easiest place to go. H-A-L-L-E-T-T. Awesome. Dean, thank you so much uh, for your advice, wisdom, and experience today. Uh, I've learned a lot and enjoyed our conversation, and I think it's going to add value to everybody who listens to it. So thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Jay. It's been great being here, and I really enjoyed the interaction, too. Hey, I hope this video has helped you with some tips and ideas to build a business that lasts. Make sure you subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss out on the next videos that we roll out. And more importantly, for some awesome free resources, head over to our website at buildingabusinessthatlasts.com. You can get a free copy of my book there where I tell you how I have built an agency that's grown year over year for the last 20 years in a row. So go grab that, buildingabusinessthatlasts.com, and make sure to subscribe to our channel. Thanks. We'll see you soon.